step. Well, take your copy of God's Word and turn to Psalm 150. Psalm 150. We are ending our series today and uh, in the Psalms, and uh, so we're going to end with the last Psalm, Psalm 150. So here's a question for you this morning. Have you ever really thought about every time you take a breath? Have you ever thought about your breathing? Like now you're gonna think about it, right? <laughs> you're gonna get like psycho, a little weird, little kind of feeling. According to the American Lung Association, the average person takes between 17,000 and 33,000 breaths a day. The average, average person uh, breathes in about 22,000 breaths a day. Think about that, 22,000 breaths a day. And so, um, for most people, that the spread is that every minute you breathe either 12 or 20 breaths every minute. Now, we also know that the younger you are, the more breaths you take. Now, according to medical research, breathing is very important. Because your body relies on oxygen to live. Every system in your body depends on it from cognition to digestion. Effective breathing uh, gives you better mental clarity. So when your oxygen level is where it should be, you think better, uh, you sleep better, you digest food better, your immune system is, uh, is at height uh, capacity and when you're breathing effectively, it actually reduces stress. And that's why a lot of times when you are really stressed out, you want to breathe in and breathe out. Now, we don't really think about our breathing, even though you're gonna take eight million, over eight million breaths this year. The only time you ever think about breathing is if you have respiratory issues. And so if you've got a cold, if you've got a sinus infection, if you've got bronchitis, pneumonia, you, you, you think about breathing. Or if you're underwater, you think about breathing. So here's what I want you to hear this morning. If you are still breathing, you are alive. Amen? And if you are alive... You are still breathing, and the reason why you were given breath is to praise the Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we read Psalm 150. The Psalm writer says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise God the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Psalm 1, we looked at a few weeks ago, taught us that the blessed person is the person who meditates on the Word of God day and night. Psalm 150, the outro to the book of Psalms, the grand finale, says that the blessed person is the one who worships God day and night and night. Here you have the beginning of the Psalms to be a person of the word. Here you have the end of Psalms to be a person of worship. The blessed person is in the word and is worshiping God. The Psalm 150 gives us 13 commands. Six verses give us 13 commands with the main point of praise the Lord. And so a blessed person is a person of the word and a person of worship. And so as we looked in Psalm 1 and we saw that there's a choice, the, the person of faith chooses the word, the person of fear chooses the world. Today, the person of faith worships the Lord, the person of fear worships themselves. 
And so today we're gonna understand what the psalmist is getting at and what we find is that Psalm 150 commands us to praise the Lord regardless of where we are and what we're going through with all that we have and all that we are for who God is and what he has done. And so let's just unpack that sentence. The Bible commands us to praise the Lord regardless of where we are and what we're going through. Verse one, the very first phrase, praise the Lord. That is in the Hebrew, the word hallelujah. Hallelujah is uh, a word that is transliterated from Hebrew into English. And it is a com compound Hebrew word that has two words put together. The first word that is a part of hallelujah is the word Yah or Yahweh. Yahweh is the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. It's a covenant-keeping, faithful name of God. It is the I am who I am. Moses, it's not who you are that matters. It's who I am that matters. The word Yahweh in the Hebrew thought is, is, sounds like breath. Like I love saying the word Yahweh because it sounds like breathe in and breathe out. The thought of the ancients was that God, when you say his name, it's breathing in and breathing out. That God is as close to you as your next breath. The second word, not only Yah, but halal. Halal is a word in the Hebrew which doesn't just mean singing, doesn't just mean praising, but it means celebrating and partying. It means raising your hands, jumping up and down, shouting and celebrating. So I don't know if you've ever gone to a sporting event. When people go to a sporting event, they do halal very good. <laughs> they don't just sit here and like. <laughs> they're raising their hands, they're cheering, they're yelling things, some we can't say on the stage. <laughs> like if you ever, like these Georgia Bulldog fans, they're some of the rowdiest group of people ever, right? And now they, they run around with their chest out. We won two. Good for you. <laughs> Kentucky basketball's won eight. <laughs> Amen. If you go to Africa, one of the common phrases that you'll find when you meet people that speak Swahili is they'll say the word Buana Asafiwe. Buana Asafiwe is praise the Lord in in African, in Swahili. And, and if you meet a fellow Christian and that person that's a fellow Christian doesn't come to you with the first word saying, Buana Asafiwe, then they think there's something terribly wrong with you and you may now be an enemy of God. And so the thought is, is that praise the Lord is a lifestyle. And so what you have here is the psalmist is saying, this is not a suggestion, this is not a request, this is a command, this is a lifestyle. 13 times we are commanded to praise the Lord. And then he says, praise him in his sanctuary. Now that idea of sanctuary, uh, I don't know if you grew up in, in, you know, in the church and, and that was the word, well, we're gonna go into worship in the sanctuary. Uh, but the sanctuary just simply means his, the holy place, the place where God dwells. And so where does God dwell? Well, God dwells in heaven. Wherever God is, that's where heaven is. And so if you could have gates of pearl, streets of gold, and a mansion next to the beach, and God is not there, that's not heaven, that's hell. Heaven's where God is. Uh, where else is God? Well, God meets in the midst of the congregation. Jesus says, we're two or three gathered in my name. I'm there in the midst. You understand that the Holy Spirit of God is in this room right now. But, but more importantly, more ultimately, not only is God in heaven, and not only is God in the congregation of the saints, but he's also, if you're a Christian, he's inside of you. That if you are a Christian, you are his sanctuary. You are the place where God chooses to dwell. It's been said that in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. 
So the temple that you have, the house that you live in is also the house that God lives in. And so he's saying, praise him in the sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. The word heavens in the Hebrew means the mighty expanse. So in other words, you are to praise God everywhere, to praise him above and here below. And what you have to understand is that the voices of heaven and the voices of earth join in perfect harmony to praise the Lord. The Bible says in Revelation chapter four, five, seven, and 19 that in heaven right now there is an ongoing worship service. Revelation chapter 19 verse six says that this is what they're singing right now. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory. So right now, 24 hours, seven days a week, all of heaven is surrounding the throne of God, worshiping God, laying down their crowns, and singing at his feet for the one who was, who is, and is to come. And if you are a believer, you have been invited to join in what God is doing, what's going on in heaven for God. You are invited to join in to sing into the chorus of the universe to praise and worship God who is worthy. You're invited into that. Now, have you ever been somewhere and you didn't feel like you belong there? Have you ever been somewhere and you're like, man, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be there. The other day, a few months ago, April and I were invited to go to some dinner party uh, in town, with some, some friends that we have, and I was invited. People from all over the country were at this particular dinner party, and um, and we were there, and I walk into this really, really nice restaurant, and uh, we are seated at a table. My, my friend is at this table and his wife. And, and then to my right, sitting next to me, was a political operative, a famous one, who was pretty influential in the Clinton White House and also served for, very, for many presidential campaigns. Uh, across from me was a multi-billionaire who was just a billionaire, Okay? <laughs> And then to my left in front of my wife was a U.S. Olympian medal winning figure skater. And there April and I were. <laughs> and we're hearing them, them talk and, and they're talking about their vacation homes all over the world. They're talking about their luxury yachts. They're talking about their struggle with their nannies and watching their kids. And I... And I look at April, and she looks at me, and I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> I'm just a preacher, okay? <laughs> We're not supposed to be here. Well, do you understand? We really, we're not supposed to be worshiping God because we're sinners. Do you understand that worshiping God is a privilege? You and I have no business hearing angels sing. We have no business seeing elders lay down their crowns. We have no business witnessing cherubim hover over the throne because we're just a bunch of nobodies. As one of my friends says, we are a bunch of misfit toys. But yet we've been invited into an opportunity that we have no business being at except for one thing. Jesus Christ invited us to be there. And so the psalmist is teaching us, and what the Bible is teaching us is that if my body is a temple where God dwells, and if I've been invited by Jesus to join the chorus of the universe to give praise to God, then that means regardless of where I am and regardless of what is happening in my life, I am to praise the Lord. And we need to praise God even when we don't feel like it. And we need to praise God even when we're hurting. You know, the one thing that you're gonna find in the Bible, the one thing you're gonna find in the book of, the, uh, book of Psalms is that God does not ever want you to come to him fake because he can smell your fake you out. God wants us to come to him who we are. He wants us to be real. He wants us to be transparent. He wants us to be vulnerable. That's why you'll have Psalms like Psalm 88, verse 14, where the psalmist is crying out to God in worship, oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Have you ever felt like God just threw you away? God, why are you just throwing me away? I feel like I'm a million miles from you. What's up? Or Psalm 56, verses three and four, the psalmist says that when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, and God whose word I praise, and God I trust, and I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? The psalmist says, hey, God, I'm scared. You know, sometimes we have this mindset that if you're a Christian, you can't be afraid. Well, when you are afraid, bring it to God. Psalm 69, verse four, 
more in number than the hairs on my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who want to destroy me. Mighty are those who attack me with lies. Now, David must have had a lot of hair. He didn't have as much as I did. But he says, listen, God, I'm, I got people that hate me. I got people that are lying about me. I got people that are, that, are, that are just causing all kinds of problems in my life. And so what this teaches us is this, is it teaches us that in the good times and the bad times and sunshine and storms and triumphs and in trials and excitement and agony, there is one thing we should do, praise the Lord. In times of fear, praise him. In times of uncertainty, praise him. In darkness and doubt, praise him. In heartbreak and hurt, praise him. In disappointment and despair, praise him. Because we can praise God at any time and any place because he's always worthy of our praise. It is always the right time to praise the Lord. The song that we began with this morning, praise, says this, I'll praise you in the valley, praise you on the mountain. I'll praise you when I'm sure, and I'll praise you when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered, and I'll praise when surrounded, because praise is the water my enemies drown in. Martin Luther put it this way. He said, the devil, the, original, the originator of sorrowful anxieties and restless troubles, flees before the sound of music, almost as much as before the word of God. Music is a gift and grace of God, not an invention of men. Thus it drives out the devil and makes people cheerful. Then one forgets all wrath, impurity, and other devices. You start singing, you start praising, and God will change it. So when we gather together here, do you understand that when we gather, this is not Christian karaoke? I mean, it's not. And this isn't a TED Talk, because I'm a whole lot longer than a TED Talk. When we're here gathering, this is to worship the Lord. And you may not feel like it. You may came in here and you, you said, Pastor, you don't know the hell I went through this week. You don't know what's going on in my life. And you don't feel like raising your hands and you don't feel like clapping your hands. But here's what I'm gonna say, do it anyway. Because here's what I found. I found this to be true, that if I get my body in the right position, everything else follows. You know, sometimes, any of you ever not feel like working out in the morning? And you know, I don't wanna work out in the morning, but then you get out of bed and you work out and, you, and everything seems to follow. The same here. You may not feel like worshiping, but when you put your body in the right position, then things happen, your mind and your soul change. And why is it important to worship God? Because in this room and, 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 on, and on, on other locations and other things, when we worship together, God shows up and he shows out. When we worship together, powerful stuff happens. Chains break, lives are healed, relationships are mended, and souls are saved. I've heard story after story after story of stuff that God's doing this summer when we gather together in this room. I believe there's something powerful that God does when the saints of God gather around the word of God and the worship of God. There's something that just happens, and it's only a God thing. Amen. And so praise the Lord regardless of what you're going through. Regardless of where you are, number two, we're to praise him with what we have and with all that we are. Verses three through five, we have this list. Here the psalmist prescribes or describes different ways to praise the Lord. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with loop, lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Yes, you can dance, Baptist. You can do it. The Pentecostals in this room have been doing it for years. <laughs> if you're Catholic and Lutheran, you can dance too. <laughs> Praise him with strings. Praise him with the pipe. Now, that's not the kind of pipe you're thinking, all right? <laughs> Praise him with sounding cymbals. And here's the other thing. I like this. I shared this earlier. Praise him with loud, crashing cymbals. I researched what that word loud means in Hebrew. Guess what it means? Loud. <laughs> in other words, what the psalmist is saying is that use whatever you got and use it to the highest to praise God to the fullest. It's just what the heart of the law is, right? The Deuteronomy 6.5, the Shema says that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Now, as the psalmist here is describing different instruments, those are instruments that were contextualized to the time period in which it was written. 
And what the Bible here is doing in contextualizing is not prescribing that we have to start playing the lute around here. I don't even know what a lute is. I guess it's a flute. I don't know. Maybe they just added an F to it and got flute. <laughs> it describes worship, but it doesn't prescribe which instruments or styles you have to use. And so what the Bible teaches about worship is it doesn't say you have to use this instrument or you have to do this style of worship. It really just says what makes the most sense to the culture and the time period. Now let me let you in on something. I'm gonna let you in on a secret. All right, don't tell some people. God does not have a preferred style of worship. Did you know that? He doesn't. And also, he doesn't have a preferred language of worship. You say, what about that? I thought God's heavenly language was English. (laughs) (laughs) So in other words, God does not prefer Gregorian chants over pipe organs. And God does not prefer, prefer contemporary worship songs to classic hymns. And God doesn't prefer Southern gospel to Christian rap. And God doesn't prefer choir and orchestra to bluegrass and banjos, although we do know God loves bluegrass and banjos, amen? (laughs) He just does. It's in the Bible. Second Hesitations. (laughs) Chapter three, it's the Kentucky section, all right? (laughs) Where it says, thou must worship, or thou must like the University of Kentucky. (laughs) It's somewhere in the back of the book, all right? Just kidding, I don't want an email over that. I don't want one. If if you want to email somebody, I'll pray about it, all right? (laughs) But there's no preferred worship style. Let me just let you in on something. We have a tendency to say that this is the only worship style and try to impose it on everybody else. So I was in Africa uh, in January, and uh, not only was I there with compassion, and hey, listen, we've got hundreds of kids in two centers that we, our church is supporting, and their lives are being changed, because of your generosity. So praise God for that, amen? (laughs) Praise God for that. But I was there, and so not only did I do Compassion, but I went to some churches, and and we also went to some churches with Compassion as well, also with the IMB. And so we went to some churches, and they were worshiping uh, in a a cultural way. They they worshiped their heart language, and so it was in Swahili, and they uh, they worshiped in a very African way. And and then I went to another church, it's a very small church with some of our missionaries, and we went there, and the entire service was in English. And it felt like a worship service in America in the 1950s. And so, I mean, the sermon was good. The the music was good. It was Christ exalting. It was good. But I went to our workers there and I said, hey, you know, when we went to other churches, it is distinctly culturally appropriate. I go to this church and I feel like I've been transported back in time in America. I said, what happened? And the missionary said, yeah, unfortunately, a long time ago, when missionaries came and planted that church, they told that church and that leadership, this is only, there's only one way you can worship the Lord, and that's this way. And I remember thinking like, these poor people, they don't get to worship from their heart. They don't get to worship God the way God uniquely made them to be. They gotta follow someone else's style. And that's what I'm trying to say with you this morning is that often we take our preferences of worship and elevate them to be the only way that you can worship God. And we want to almost colonize people or impose on people preferences and traditions that are not biblical. Here's what our vision is, and you need to understand this if you want to move forward with us as a church. We are a multi-generational, multi-ethnic church. Okay, that's just who we are. And so... As a multi-generation, multi-ethnic church, we are always, as believers, going to look for ways to die to self for the sake of others in the advance of the gospel. Now, the reality is, is that the American culture has shaped the church more than the church has shaped American culture. And so one of the things you see in 21st century church is what I call Burger King church, which is, it's all about having it your way. And so a lot of people, what they do, maybe you're here this morning and you're like, oh, this is my first time, maybe my last time. And I hope it's not. I hope you keep coming back. But sometimes people go look for churches like they're looking for a restaurant. And it's all about the consumer experience. And so some people, we've, and this, the church has per- perpetuated this. We've perpetuated a culture where people will only come to your church if it's something they like that's convenient to them at a price that's acceptable. 
And what happens is, is they find that, but if you're in that church long enough, it won't be acceptable, it won't be convenient, it may not be something you like, and so what you do is you leave that church and you go to another one. And what you see is that what we have made in the American church is instead of the worship of God, we have turned it into the worship of self. And you say, well, I don't know, I come here to worship God. Here's how you can tell if you've turned it from the worship of God to the worship of self, if the only metric you have for how good a service was is how much you liked it or what you got from it, you've made it about you. See, when we make it all about what we got from it, or when we make it all about uh, how we liked it, then God has ceased to be the center of our worship and we've replaced him with ourselves and we've become the object of our worship. Do you understand that you and I are not here to worship me and you and I are not here to worship you? We are here to worship the Lord. You know, there was, there's always been worship wars. I mean, back in Jesus' day, Jesus met this lady at a well. She's a shady lady of Samaria. And, and she was having a conversation with Jesus. And, and the conversation went like this. This woman said, well, we were taught you can only worship God here. And Jesus was like, no, 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 no. It's not just there. It's not just there. Here's what he says, John 4, 23. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, there's some people that think that all God needs and all God desires is our worship. And there is a sense in which we were created to worship. But more than what God is looking, more than God, God is not just looking for worship. God is looking for worshipers. But how you worship matters as well. See, we have some churches that it's all about the spirit. And, and you come in there and it's, 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 it's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Okay? It just is. If it's all spirit, you're going to blow up. But there's some churches, it's all truth. And it's dry. Like, they squeak when they walk. And if it's all truth, you're going to dry up. But Jesus says when it's spirit and truth, that's how you grow up. And that's what God's looking for. And God does not have a preferred worship style. But God is looking for people whose hearts desire him. And that's gonna look different in different places around the world. It's gonna be different worshiping God in Belize than it is in Burma. It's gonna be different worshiping God in Australia as it is in Austria. It's gonna be different worshiping God in America as it is in India. It just is what it is. But it's all about spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the truth of the gospel. And when the spirit of God and the truth of God come together, you have the genuine worship of God. And it's gonna be different in different places because at the end of the day it's all about heart language if I went around this room there are hundreds and hundreds of people in this room and hundreds of people watching online and I were to ask you what's your favorite song I guarantee you we would get hundreds of different names of songs hundreds of different styles of songs and styles of music but if it's from the heart that's all God wants as long as it is spirit and truth and when it comes from the heart, in whatever language you speak, in whatever culture you're from, if you're bringing it to God because you desire God, that's what God desires. That's what he wants. But let me let you in on one more thing. Because as you go through this list, it's a lot of musical instruments. But the worship of God is more than just singing. It's not less than singing, but it's more than singing. Because you worship God in doing what God created you to do. So if you read Psalm 148, 149, 150, one of the things you'll see in 148 is you'll see how creation worships God. And so if you go out this afternoon and you go to the beach and you see birds flying in the air, they're worshiping God. Because why? They're doing what they were created to do. They were created to fly. Now if you see stuff falling from them from the sky, they're worshiping God. Because that's what they were created to do. If you, see, if you go and you, look in the, and you look in the water and you see a fish swimming around, that fish is worshiping God. 
because that's what that fish was created to do. And so God uniquely created you, gave you gifts, gave you, gave you talents, gave you abilities and passions. And when you do the thing that God uniquely created you to do, you are worshiping God. So you can worship God in your work and you worship God in your parenting and you worship God in your marriage and you worship God through your art and you worship God through your recreation. So you can worship God and play pickleball at the same time. You can even worship God in taking a nap, which some of you, you're doing right now, and it's certainly good. <laughs> Don't wake him up. <laughs> if your neighbor next to you is asleep, he's worshiping, okay? He's worshiping. <laughs> you know, J.D. Greer put it this way. I love what he says. This is a good statement, especially for young people in this room. You're trying to figure out what to do with life, and here's, I love this statement. He says, whatever you're good at, do it well to the glory of God and do it strategic somewhere for the mission of God. I mean, Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He says, whether you eat or whether you drink. So today, when you have lunch, or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Why? Because as we have said here along, uh, for, for a while, worship is not a preference. Worship is a lifestyle. Okay, it's not that I come to church and worship. No, you come to church to gather with other worshipers so that you go out during the week and worship as well. See, we say every Sunday, have a great week of worship at the end of, the, at the end of every service. You know, some of you have never even thought about what that means. Here's what it means. It means that worship on Sunday isn't it. We worship every day of the week. And that when we worship on Sundays, it is an overflow of the worship happening during the week. And so if worship is only a Sunday thing, you're setting yourself up for failure for the rest of the week. So here, let's go back to it. I got a little ahead of myself. Here's what he says. He says that we are to praise the Lord regardless of where we are and regardless of what we're going through. We're to praise the Lord with all that we have and all that we are. And we're to praise the Lord for who he is and what he has done. Verse two. Praise him for his mighty deeds according to his excellent greatness. The psalmist grounds the commands of praise in our daily lives for two reasons. We are to praise him for who he is and what he has done. God has done great things for us. Do you understand how many ways God has blessed you this week? I love, John Piper said this. He says, God has done thousands of things in your life this week and you might only be aware of three of them. But God has blessed you. He has done great things for you. He has created you. He sustains you. If you're a Christian, he has adopted you, has saved you, forgiven you, keeps you, and blesses you. You are too blessed to be stressed. I mean, think of all the great things he has done. But the mightiest deed that God has done for us is sending Jesus to die for our sins, be buried, and three days later rise from the dead. That Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves and that through his victorious actions on our behalf, we are saved. And so the natural response to being forgiven is to praise the Lord. He is the reason why we sing. But it's because of his excellent greatness. E Listen, this is gonna be hard for some of y'all to swallow. Even if God did nothing for us, he's still worthy of our praise. Because there's none higher, there's none greater than he is. And so to praise God is to genuinely know God. Because he's not the God of our own understanding. He's greater than we can imagine. He's not the God of our own thoughts or what we wish him to be. He is who he is as revealed in his word. And so, if you want to grow in your worship of God, you need to grow in your understanding and knowledge of God. A.W. Tozer, in his great book, The Knowledge of the Holy, writes this. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion and that man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. The reason why we teach the word of God, the reason why we teach the, the, the works of God, the reason why we teach about God here is so that the more you know him, the more you love him, and the better you worship him. See, what you're gonna have to understand is that God has done great things for you because that's who he is. See, what God has done flows out of the fact that this is who God is. So 
if God loves you, which he does, it's because he is love. God is good to us because he is good. God forgives us because he's forgiving. God does awesome things because he alone is awesome. And we worship him because he's the only one, the only one that is worthy of our worship. David said in Psalm 8, he says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've set into place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the son of man that you take care of him. Worship him for who he is, for what he has done. And then verse six, he says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Every living thing is living because it's breathing. The difference between you and the chair you're sitting in is you are breathing, hopefully. Every living thing is breathing, and every breathing thing is living for the purpose of praising the Lord. What the Bible is teaching us here is the reason you have breath, the reason that you are breathing in and the reason that you are breathing out is for one reason and one reason only, and that's to praise the Lord. A few years ago, a long time ago, almost 15 years ago, I was in chapel at Southern Seminary in Louisville, and David Platt was preaching on the platform, and he was preaching Psalm 150, and I never will forget what he said, which I ended up finding out he got from somebody else, but it is what it is, and here's what he said. He said, what if the last phrase in the book of Psalms were switched around? What if instead of it saying, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, what if it said, let everything that praises the Lord have breath? Do you understand that the purpose of your life, every breath you take, every move you make, every word you say is to praise God for who he is and what he has done? It's the truth. And we are to praise God in every single moment in our life, in every thought, in every decision, in how you treat other people, and how you love other people, and how you live, work, and play. You praise the Lord for who he is and what he's done. So if you summed up Psalm 150, here's how you would sum it up. What does it mean to praise the Lord? Where? Everywhere. Everywhere in the sanctuary, in the heavens, and all over the earth. When? All the time and in every situation. How? With everything you got. Why? For who he is and what he has done. And who is to praise the Lord? Everyone who has breath. See, we are to praise the Lord regardless of where we are or what we're going through with what we have and all that we are for who he is and what he has done. So let me end with this. Have you ever heard the phrase, wasting your breath? Waste of breath? Like have you ever, some of you parents, you ever talk to your kids and tell them stuff and you think in your head, I'm just wasting my breath. Anybody in the room want to testify to that one? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. We're going to have revival in a minute. <laughs> what does it mean to waste your breath? Or you say, I'm not going to waste my breath on you. It, it means that you're, you're not going to waste your time. You're not going to waste your energy. You're not going to waste your breath telling somebody something that they're not going to do and they're not going to listen to. It's not worth your breath. It's not worth your energy because they're just gonna do what they wanna do. So I got thinking about that, and I began to think about how much I waste my breath. And I began to think about, well, does God ever kinda look at me and how I live for myself and how I'm about building my kingdom? And I, ever, I just wonder, does he ever look at the angel and say, man, that's a waste of breath down there. So my question to you is this. How are you using the breath God has given you? 
How are you gonna use today the 22,000 breaths you're gonna take? How are you gonna use this year the eight million breaths you're gonna take this year? Are you gonna use that breath for yourself? For your kingdom? To do your thing? Or are you gonna use that breath to praise and glorify the Lord? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen? So no matter the season you find yourself in, the condition of your heart, the circumstances of your life, as one of my friends said, it's always the right time to praise the Lord. And so in a moment, we're gonna have a little, a little worship service. And I just hope, I hope, you, I hope you worship the Lord. And I hope you pour your heart out before him. But it's gonna be really hard to worship him if you don't know him. And the only way you can know him is by surrendering your life to him. And some of you in this room, you need to stop trying religion. You need to stop trying to please God by your good works and surrender both your bad and your good to him and trust him with your life. Because if you're still breathing, you're still alive. And if you're still alive, there's still hope. And so I'm gonna pray. And I'm gonna pray for any of you in this room and watching online, if you've never trusted Christ your Savior, I wanna give you that opportunity. What a great way to use your breath today is to ask Jesus to save you. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor, I've been living for myself and I've been wasting my breath on me, but I wanna use my breath for the glory of God. So I'm gonna pray as the Holy Spirit leads and then we're just gonna have a time of worship and then we'll get out of here. Just bow with me. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the gospel. And Father, I thank you for what you have done. For you lived a life that I could not live. You died the death I deserved to die. And three days later, you rose from the dead and you give salvation to whoever trusts in you and turns from their sins and their good works. And so God, today, for those in this room who need to trust you or those watching online that need to trust you, God, would right now, they pray a prayer like this. If you're here and you wanna trust Christ as your savior, would you pray a prayer like this? It's not some magical prayer. It's faith in Jesus that saves you. Would you pray, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've lived for myself. I've been wasting my breath. But today I realize that you're my only hope, that you lived a perfect life, that you died on the cross for me, and that you rose from the dead. So today, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of trying to play religious games and save me. I surrender my life to you and help me, Lord, to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And Father, for those who are believers, would we recommit ourselves to not wasting our breath on ourselves, but to do everything we can to praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed and trust Christ your Savior, we would love to help you and celebrate with you. You fill out that connection card. If you're here and you say, I just recommitted my life, I really, really, really wanna worship God, then here's your time. Let's stand and let's give it all we got.